I'm not going to hit this. <laughs> All right, and then we'll Ben sandwiches, folks. You haven't had dinner yet. Sandwiches. All right, we'll be able to get your your presentation on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Does everybody have a copy of the handout and some voting Okay. Yeah. Um, where is the uh, website? Where's the link to the website? Scott. Is the link on to zoom in on the website? And then to be able to share our screen. Oh, okay, she's already out there. Oh, it's you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize you're right there. How is Sky doing this? I'm like, oh, there's like some AV person in the wall. <laughs> 
Did you already open it up? Okay. How do I do this one right now? This is now Whoops. My track that is very. Is it? It's It's Yeah. It's. Great. Uh, yeah. He's supposed to put it on the this time I didn't do the buffer tap first. So we built our bed, so. You know, get some power trip, so we All right, welcome everybody. So glad to see such a full room uh, coming in to talk about climate action planning and Topsum. Uh, excited to to have you here um, on this of our second community workshops. Uh, I'm Meg Rasmussen. I am the community resilience planner at the Mid Coast Council of Governments, and we're the regional planning organization that helps communities with issues like housing, transportation, economic development, um, and of course, climate and resilience. So tonight we have a tremendous opportunity to come together and create solutions to make our lives better by uh, planning for climate change. This is the second of three public meetings during the process of updating uh, Topsum's climate action plan. So tonight we'll start with a short intro on what climate action planning is for those of you who are new to the workshops. 
Uh, and then we'll give you some important information you're going to need uh, as you decide what actions are most important for Topsum to take. And that info will include the results of a greenhouse gas inventory and two vulnerability assessments. And next, we'll get out of our seats and do a gallery walk, which you'll hear more about later. And then we'll come back together, do a little debrief, and pick our raffle winner. So here we go. Climate Action Plan is a clear, actionable plan to reduce the risks and adapt to a climate changing climate. Now, if there's benefits to doing this, uh, foremost is it reduces the risk of harm during emergencies and extreme weather events. Uh, and also over time, you know, can enhance economic vitality, improve public health, and it also saves money. Uh, because as I mentioned before, uh, the National Institute of Building Scientists found that every $1 spent on disaster prevention saves $6 in future disaster costs. So it's a nice return on investment. So it's a nice plan. The climate action planning process involves these five steps. Uh, they are community priorities and ideas and vision, which we started last winter with surveys. Uh, next, we've been working on vulnerability assessments, and we went over those and got your input in workshop number one, which was in the summer. Did a greenhouse gas inventory, we have a fact sheet on that. And now here we are doing pri uh, preliminary climate action planning, which is now the workshop two. And then we'll take all of that information and write a report uh, and then come back to you with a final climate action plan for comments. And that'll be workshop number three. And so tonight you get to understand some of the risks, tops and faces, and weigh in on which actions the town should address to, to address climate change. So we're gonna start right in with a greenhouse gas inventory. Now these, we're gonna throw a lot of information at you. Don't worry, you know, just take it in, remember some highlights. We're gonna be around to answer questions and we also have some of the um, reports and some of the relevant information kind of at our fingertips uh, to help you as you go through. So, um, and there also will be detailed reports on all of this information, but we just kind of wanted to get the highlights um, to y'all. So, definitions for today. Greenhouse gas it is carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and fluorinated gases that trap heat in the Earth's atmosphere, keeping it warm enough to support life. Now, when we do greenhouse gas inventories, there's two types. One is a community-wide inventory, which is basically a snapshot of the overall community's carbon footprint. And then a subset of that is the municipal greenhouse gas inventory, which counts emissions generated by local government operations. So greenhouse gas inventories identify where emissions are highest and you do them periodically so it can track your progress over time. And it provides data for smart decision-making in order to reduce emissions effectively. Benefits are of uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions is it improves air quality, counteracts climate change, saves money over time by using less energy, brings people together in working towards a common goal, boost the local economy uh, by attracting green businesses and creating jobs. So all together, it helps strengthen Topsum. So diving right into the community-wide inventory. The total annual emissions from Topsum equals 108,800 metric tons of CO2. But you know, what is that number? Like, what does that number mean? So it can equate to 100,000 Honda Civics, the weight of 100,000 Honda Civics. Or if you prefer to think in terms of fully loaded school buses, it's 10,000 of those. 43,000 fully loaded semis, or 15 million household pets. <laughs> uh, and where are those emissions coming from? So it's interesting because they're pretty evenly split between transportation and stationary energy. And then there's a little bit of emissions from waste. Um, transportation obviously is um, emissions from vehicles. Stationary energy is, um, yes, uh, 
energy used in things that are stationary, and that means mostly heating, cooling, and electricity used in buildings. So we will take each one of those and break it down a little bit. So in terms of waste, uh, the largest percentage, about 60% of uh, waste emissions are from wastewater. Uh, and that's typically methane and carbon dioxide from the uh, digestion in septic tanks. Municipal solid waste is about 35%, and that's uh, landfilled and flaring emissions. And then there's a little bit of uh, emissions due to effluent discharge from wastewater treatment, and that's only about 3%. Looking at transportation, passenger vehicles are the dominant source, accounting for about 70% of the total. Commercial vehicles contribute just over 27%. And public transportation accounts for a whopping 3% of this total. But this is interesting, you know, looking at stationary energy. Um, it's more complicated because there's more uh, greater uh, variety of ways to heat and cool and power uh, homes and businesses. So more pieces of the pie on this one. Uh, and if you'll see residential fuel oil and kerosene, which is the lower left-hand quadrant, um, that's about a quarter of all emissions. And it's followed by commercial energy, residential electricity, and commercial natural gas. These are um, emissions from energy used, right? And then the rest of the, the, rest of the categories, which are sort of the darker greens, uh, make up about 20% of the total. Um, commercial fuel oil, you know, residential wood, you know, they're all little bits that, that total up to about 20% of total stationary energy emissions. Now let's get into municipal greenhouse gas inventory. So the annual municipal emissions is about 750 metric tons. So that could be 750 Honda Civics or 105,000 household cats. <laughs> and interestingly, the municipal sectors are very similar to the community-wide. Basically, about an even split between transportation, vehicle emissions, and stationary energy, or the energy used to heat and cool and power the buildings. And we can break these down, too, in terms of departments. Um, not surprisingly, for transportation, public works has the greatest share, followed by the police department. You know, they drive around a lot in the course of doing their jobs. Stationary energy. Um, is a little bit of a different picture. Uh, the municipal offices, which include town office, police and fire station, the recreation department, and the solid waste building, account for about 65% of, um, of the uh, stationary energy. And that's broken down to 60% are from natural gas and 40% are from electricity. <clears throat> And the municipality has done uh, a lot of great efforts to date. So for example, they've piloted electric police cars. The municipal building has energy efficient systems, including LED lighting. Uh, they purchased solar credits, which are um, uh, help support solar energy and provide a good example uh, for people. And also many of the departments have purchased electric equipment. So there's efforts in progress, good to date. And that is that for the greenhouse gas emissions. And I know probably people are, you know, may have questions. And I tell you, you can get so far down into the weeds on these things, but we will not. We will keep it up here for right now, but I'll be around in case anybody has some nitty gritty questions they wanna ask. Now we probably have a little time. Okay, moving right along. Now I'm gonna put on a different hat and talk about the Topsom Social Vulnerability Assessment. So the questions we're gonna kind of answer in this are, what is social vulnerability and why are we including it? How is the information gathered? What are the vulnerable populations in Topsom? And how do they fit into climate action planning? So what is social vulnerability? Well, it helps us understand who might need more help to stay safe and recover when bad things happen. You know, some groups are more vulnerable because they might have fewer resources or less support or face other challenges that make it harder for them to recover. 
uh, a person's age, income, housing, and access to transportation are, are all good indicators of whether they might be at risk. And we do assessments because they can identify at-risk populations, you know, focusing on specific groups of people like the elderly, low-income families, or people with disabilities who may face greater challenges during emergencies or adapting to change. It highlights uh, resource needs to identify where investments like better housing, improved healthcare, or easier access to emergency services um, could really make a difference to reduce risks to, the, to uh, Thompson's community. It strengthens resilience planning because you can use data to create actions that help the whole community prepare for and respond to and recover um, from climate challenges. And it promotes fairness uh, because you, making sure the plans includes the needs of vulnerable people uh, helps build stronger communities as a whole. So Topsum in particular, our data sources. The first one was you. Um, the Energy Committee did a survey last winter and respondents identified specific groups they thought were vulnerable to climate change. We got some um, responses uh, like the, the one here, the person concerned about elderly and low-income neighbors. <clears throat> In addition, there is a thing called the Maine Social Vulnerability Index, which is a tool that outlines socioeconomic and democratic, demographic indicators that point to how resilient different populations are when faced with challenges. And it was interesting to note how closely the um, two data sources, the survey from you guys and the main social vulnerability index um, results kind of aligned on, um, on what the indicators might be, the most important indicators uh, might be for Topsum, right? And then using US, US census data, we can use these indicators to analyze Topsum's residents. So census data is information collected every 10 years uh, to count the entire population and gather details about people living in the country. And the data includes information on age, gender, income, education, things like that. Okay, so now looking at Thompson residents. So we'll spend a little time on this slide. So um, what you're seeing is are the vulnerability indicators uh, listed along the bottom. And what you're seeing on the slide are the number of residents who might have that vulnerability indicator. And in this chart, you know, one person can be counted several times by having multiple indicators. So for example, a child could be counted as uh, again, if living below the poverty line and again, you know, living in a mobile home. So this is, um, uh, you know, there's, what am I trying to say? There's many, there could be many people in each of these, each of these indicators. Um, so Topsom's total population is 9,750-ish, according to the latest census. And seniors, 65 plus, about 20% of the population are the largest uh, vulnerable, vulnerable group. That equates to just over 2,200 people. Next is youth at about 1,800. Seniors living alone and people with disabilities both come in at about 1,450 people. Now, seniors, youth, and people with disabilities could indeed have lots of resources. So just having an indicator doesn't necessarily mean that a person is vulnerable, but it provides a good sort of order of magnitude a snapshot of potentially numbers of vulnerable, vulnerable people and the kind of the categories that we might take a look at. Uh, looking from the other direction, numbers of people without vehicles, 630, living in mobile homes, 880, <clears throat> And below the poverty line, about a thousand is also a good way to understand social vulnerability in Topsum. Now you might see self-employed there. And why would that be there? Well, because self-employed people off could have unstable incomes and may lack benefits like health insurance and sick leave and stuff like that. They also might be more financially at risk during emergencies when they can't work and they may have less access to support programs like unemployment benefits. And then not to mention also the unhoused and those with medical, medical conditions where there's not you know, census data you know, on those um, issues, but we know there are people within those categories who are also vulnerable. Also vulnerable. 
So in climate action planning, the thing to ask mm -hmm. yourselves as you're kind of going around here is who in our community does this action serve? How were vulnerable populations involved in developing or prioritizing the action? What needs of vulnerable populations does the action address? And how will this action increase resilience of vulnerable populations? Now it's a piece of the, it's a piece of the puzzle. You know, we're we're trying to include the entire community in Topsum, and this is a piece of things to be asking yourself. So to recap, social vulnerability is how likely certain people or groups are affected by problems like natural disasters or health issues due to fewer resources or support. Uh, looking at Topson's social vulnerability strengthens resilience planning by identifying at-risk groups and where resources are needed. And there are about 11 groups identified uh, with vulnerability indicators of some significance um, in, in Topson. And the questions to ask as you prioritize actions include how will this action affect Topson's vulnerable people? Thank you. Those are the highlights of the, the social vulnerability index. And now I'm going to turn it over to Julian Main from Happy Environmental. She will continue on with more vulnerability assessment findings. Mouse for some reason. It seems squiggling a little bit. Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah. Let me just stop sharing for just a second, just to see if that works. My computer confused. All right, guys. share this screen. There it is. Huh? Okay. Yeah. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for bearing with me. <laughs> um, so yeah, as Meg said, um, I'm Julia Main. Um, I work for a company called FB Environmental, um, and we worked on the baseline climate change vulnerability assessment. Um, so this was one of the three components of the update to the louder. Uh, so this was one of the three. Com is that better? This was one of the three components um, to the update for the climate action plan, um, along with the greenhouse gas inventory and the social vulnerability assessment. So the vulnerability assessment that we were completing um, was focused on infrastructure. So looking at how climate change is impacting Topsom's infrastructure now and how it will impact Topsom's infrastructure in the future. So what did we look at in this assessment? Um, so this is an example of some of the types of infrastructure that we were um, evaluating. We also considered public health and safety. And then we also um, considered some private infrastructure like private homes um, and private water supplies and things like that. So these are the climate impacts or climate hazards um, is another um, term that we use. Um, so these are the impacts that we looked at um, in the vulnerability assessment. Um, and some of them are interrelated, um, but we looked at extreme storms and precipitation. Um, so, you know, heavy rainfall events, sea level rise and flooding, increasing temperatures, uh, shifting hab habitats and impacts to agriculture. 
and then drought and wildfire. So um, I, there's a lot of information, like Meg said, that's in the vulnerability assessment, and we have a copy of it here tonight. So if anyone is interested in looking at that or any of the maps, um, that's here, um, and you can look at it. But I'm going to just cover some of the high-level kind of key points and key takeaways from the assessment. Um, so thinking about the hazards that kind of emerge to the top um, as really significant um, impacts um, for Topsom currently and in the future, uh, flooding and extreme storms really came to the top as something that's impacting Topsom currently and is expected to continue to be um, something that Topsom will have to think about in the future. Um, second, um, increasing temperatures and drought um, are something that have impacted Topsom to some extent, um, but could definitely impact Topsom more in the future. And you know, currently we're in a drought right now, which um, I did not know until someone told me the other day. Um, so it just goes to show that you know there are our climate is changing. <laughs> um, so third is sea level rise. Um, this is slightly lower down on the list um, because the impacts of sea level rise in Topsom are isolated to a pretty specific area around the Muddy River, um, and they're also expected to happen on the longer term rather than on the shorter term. And then final, um, or finally, uh, is wildfire. Um, and so the impacts of wildfire are, you know, could be very severe. Um, however, the, the risk is relatively low because of the, you know, type of environment that we live in. But it's still important to consider because a wildfire could have pretty significant impacts for the community. Um, so thinking about key infrastructure um, that's vulnerable in Topsom, Roads and bridges, um, and particularly their vulnerability to flooding, um, sort of emerged as uh, one of the key considerations for um, infrastructure. Residential homes and their vulnerability to flooding um, was also something that we heard a lot about um, and saw through the, the vulnerability assessment. Um, I think working farms also, we noted some um, vulnerabilities that, um, that, uh, that those folks have. Um, particularly drought um, and increasing temperatures and sort of the um, all of the impacts um, that that has, including changes in the growing season, pests, diseases, things like that. Um, and then also the impact that farms can have on stormwater runoff, um, particularly uh, around the Cadence River. Um, and then finally, were impacts to private water supplies. There's a lot of people in the community who rely on private wells. Um, so those folks are more vulnerable to drought conditions. And then finally, some important public health and safety concerns that emerged through the assessment are power outages. I think we heard about those a lot in the workshop, um, the first workshop that Meg was talking about. Um, and it was definitely something that um, when we were you know, looking through all the assessment results kind of kept coming up. Um, I think extreme heat um, and heat waves is also a concern, particularly like Meg said, with an older population. Um, and that's particularly in the more developed parts of town. So basically right here where we are, because um, these areas are heat islands that tend to be warmer than the, the sort of uh, more rural areas um, further afield. Um, and then brown tail moth and ticks um, are also concerns that a lot of people had. Um, and both of those um, are, uh, Climate change is expected to um, make both brown tail moths and ticks um, more prevalent. So if I had to sum it up in sort of what the biggest concerns for Topsom are, I would say it's roads and bridges, flooding, storms, and power outages. So if you can take one thing away tonight, take that away. So I want to talk a little bit more specifically about some of the flooding impacts because that was something we talked a lot about during the first workshop, and I know it's something the town has thought a lot about. Um, so this is a map of Topsom. We've got the Androscoggin River on the sort of southern boundary, um, the Cadence River uh, kind of along the northern boundary, and then the Muddy River there um, dumping into sort of the Androscoggin River and Mary Meeting Bay. So thinking about roads and bridges that are vulnerable to flooding, I won't sort of go through each of these, but these dots are just highlighting the areas where these vulnerability hotspots are. Um, the roads that we heard about a lot um, were Meadow Road, Foresight Road, and Pleasant Point Road. Um, th these are all known uh, areas of flooding um, in the town, both from residents and from the town, um, the town staff. 
Um, and the town is working on particularly the Pleasant Point Road and addressing some of the flooding concerns there. And then thinking about sea level rise, um, foresight. So the impacts of sea level rise are really isolated to the area around the Muddy River. Um, and Foresight Road and Pleasant Point Road are um, the, the two areas uh, that are most likely to be impacted by more frequent or increased flooding because of sea level rise. But like I said, those impacts are expected to happen more on the long term rather than on the shorter term. Um, there's also erosion that's already happening at Pleasant Point, which the town is working on addressing, um, but that's something that um, could be worsened with sea level rise. So I just wanted to show some pictures of um, some of the flooding. I mean, you all probably have seen and experienced a lot of this yourselves, um, but it's just kind of helpful to see it, uh, you know, what it looks like on the ground. So then thinking about some homes and buildings um, and some areas of town that are vulnerable to flooding. Um, again, I won't go through all of these, um, but these were some of the areas that either emerged through our analysis or through the community workshop. Um, and so a couple notes, um, there are two industrial operations along the Androscoggin, right here, wait, wait to it. Um, and so those are um, important because there are other environmental implications for flooding in that area. Um, and then there are a number of other neighborhoods where flooding is either a current issue or a potential issue. Um, and then I wanted to highlight um, concerns that residents had um, in Ivanhoe Drive and Bay Park. Um, so a lot of folks, my understanding is experienced basement flooding during, um, I see some panic heads, <laughs> um, during, um, you know, extreme rainfall events um, and storms. I know there's been issues with septic system failure in Bay Park as well. Um, so I know that Bay Park, um, there were some discussions last time, is in an area where there's a naturally high water table. So my understanding is that this has been a pretty long time um, issue there, um, but it's definitely something that, you know, with the really intense rainfall events that we're seeing and that we're projected to see in the future, um, you know, that could continue to become worse. Um, and then in Ivanhoe Drive, I don't know as much about that particular neighborhood. Um, there's a lot of folks who felt that um, the flooding that they were seeing was from groundwater rise, and that is a possibility, um, but it also could be from surface water runoff. Um, so I think understanding the causes of, you know, where that flooding is coming from will be important for addressing the concerns of those residents. So I wanted to end on a positive note um, and something that I found really interesting as I was doing this assessment is that a lot of the flood prone, the flood prone land in Topsom um, is actually already conserved. So about 40% of flood prone land um, is conserved and then about 54 to 60, sorry, 54 to 56% of land that is vulnerable to sea level rise is conserved. Um, and the primary areas where this is, is the upper Cadence and then around the Muddy River. What's also cool, thank you, Victor, for this suggestion. I don't know where he is. Um, he suggested looking at where the, how the town's conservation focus areas overlap with the vulnerable areas. And there's, uh, there's a lot of overlap there. And so this positions Topsom really well for continuing to improve um, or sort of enhance existing flood mitigation through additional conservation efforts. So I think that's just kind of, you know, a hopeful um, thought to end on. So that was a lot of information. <laughs> um, and we are going to talk about the, the work that we're going to be doing after this, but I did want to take a few minutes for anyone to ask questions um, either for me or for Meg about the greenhouse gas inventory, the infrastructure vulnerability assessment, or the social vulnerability assessment. So does anyone have any questions? <coughs> yeah. Um, I was wondering about food waste. So waste is a little strip at the top of that. Mm -hmm. that thing. Is food waste, um, you know, greenhouse gases from food waste? If it goes, where does that, the, if it goes to the landfill, it's, yeah. that's where it but it doesn't stay there, it goes elsewhere, but it's still counted? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
think it would be wise to check my recollection, but I believe that the um, the assessment of um, greenhouse gases in 2012 showed that 72% of Topland greenhouse gases came from transportation. And yours showed much less, more like from the grass, like 50%. And I'm wondering if you may have used a different methodology or whether really things changed or well, why the difference? Yeah, it was, it, we couldn't compare apples to apples because there was a similar methodology, but not all of the inputs were the same. And I think too, so I think when you when it was done before, there was an actual counts from DOT um, for some of the for some of the traffic. And in this one, we use some other um, DOT data, but it wasn't actual counts. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that transportation has gone down. You know, if anything, it's gone up, right? So mm -hmm. I I think the the main thing was that it was a higher percentage because we were counting as much of the other um, stationary energy costs in that assessment. Yep. You talked about some of the effects being further out in the future. Mm -hmm. Can I trap you into a number of years? You can, yes. <laughs> Thanks for asking that question. You're welcome. Um, so the state of Maine has some recommendations for planning for 2050 uh, for planning for sea level rise for 2050 and 2100. So when we were looking at these two scenarios, the impacts of the 2050 sea level rise scenario is relatively limited in Topsum um, compared to the 2100. So I think where you'd see those impacts are really between 2050 and 2100. Uh, and I can show you, we do have a map of that um, if you want to look at it. So yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. If our waste, instead of going to landfill, was to go to a trash to energy plant, does that just bring forward a lot of the CO2 gases, or does that actually lessen it over time because it's not sitting there rotting? Or... I'd have to get back to you. Right. You better recall the question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, it's such a small percentage of, of, of the emissions that if you're looking for high impact actions, you probably are better to look at, at transportation or, you know, energy use. I ask because we're um, about to put out our bid our next three years of solid waste contract. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we asked for is what the likelihood is that they're going to be, because um, it used to go to the uh, plant up in Bangor, they yeah. closed down, yeah. which I guess they're trying to reopen. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it may be a way we could affect things if we can pick a solid waste person that's going to be turning it into energy as opposed to just like filling. Yeah, and you know that's a that kind of thinking is um, you guys are doing a lot of that. It seems like a you know every little bit that you could do on that is really good. <laughs> yeah. Um, hearing about the pre prior studies, is there a sense of a total carbon um, metric tonnage that has changed from the previous study to current studies? Mm -hmm. Were more cats or less cats? <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, it was really difficult to measure um, apples to apples. My sense was that it went, but I can't quantify, you know, how much. And I think the thing to do is, you know, take some, take, you know, put some programs in place, you know, take some actions, in five years, you know, measure it again and see see what your results are. You know, anything you can do to keep it from going up or, you know, to just lower everybody's carbon footprint will be a step in the right direction. Yeah, go for it. Sorry, Sorry behind you. Um, that kind of got me thinking about the measurement because of the discrepancy. Can you help us understand how it was measured when we took, seemed like a lot of data, clearly we're not putting I was on the back of pipes of cars and measuring it that way, but it seemed like a lot of metric tons to to forecast. Uh, can you help us understand where that data came from? Yep, we used um, a protocol called um, um, ClearPath, which is a, a software program. We use uh, ICLI, which is a standard um, methodology for our measuring, and I'd be happy to 
that's you know, more get... complicated than it seems. I just was curious about it because the other part of it in my mind that I was thinking about was there must be a certain level of greenhouse gas that's necessary to keep our earth warm. Yes. Um, do we have what that number is compared to where we are so that we know an actual level of a goal where we're trying to reduce it to, or are we trying to get it to zero? Um, yeah, I mean, we're not trying to get it to zero because, you know, the, right. we need greenhouse gases to keep the, the planet warm. Um, Maine has some targets to be carbon neutral by 2050, I believe. Right. right. I do too, right. <laughs> Which, you know, and that's, that's, so it's not an absolute number. It's just like, wherever we're putting out, let's just offset it so that cumulatively in the world, we're not increasing our greenhouse gases so much that it is trapping too much heat in the, in the atmosphere. So we can't really quantify a baseline. So, well, I can't right now, but yeah. I'm, I'm happy to talk with you a little okay. bit more about yeah. this later. Sure. They, they do that at the global level. Um, so there was this, there's this global meeting that happens every several years where they, you know, they come up with this degree of warming goal, you know, for all these countries across the world. And that is, that goal is associated with carbon reduction targets for each um, country. And so for, you know, the town of Topsom or something like that, I don't know what, what that sort of equates to, but um, it is something that is done at the global. There's someone out there doing it, even though we're not doing it. <laughs> um, yeah, one more question. So you mentioned, uh, at some point in the presentation, it was mentioned that um, the risk of wildfire was thought to be low, but the damages from it potentially high. And I'm just guessing that that might be in part because the Northeast is expected to have um, a lot more rain, a lot more bad storms, and a lot more water coming down in those storms. And yet, recently, we have seen bad wildfires in New York, in Pennsylvania, and in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering how certain, given recent changes, how yeah. certain you feel of that assessment. Yeah, sorry. Are you done? No. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm glad you asked this question. This is something I've actually been spending a lot of time on this year. Um, and it's, I was actually just in New Jersey this weekend and we were driving up the highway and it was so smoky. It was very eerie. Um, and there is a lot of uncertainty, I would say, um, from scientists about what wildfire is going to look like um, in the Northeast because we are, our climate is getting wetter. That's a fact, but there's also a higher degree of variability. So the wetter times are getting wetter and the drier times are getting drier. Temperatures are increasing. Um, so all of those factors can increase the likelihood of wildfire. The other thing to understand about wildfire in the Northeast is that it's very behavior driven. Um, so it's very, it's very behavior driven. So it, the ignitions usually come from human activities so there's a lot of, um, you know, when people are burning and when the burning season happens, you know, and how that lines up with periods of high wildfire risk um, is very important for um, understanding when wildfires are actually going to happen. So I would say there is a lot of uncertainty, but I think that it is something that in Maine we do need to be thinking about um, just because there. You know, I think we have a lot of fuel in this in this state, and we also have a lot of people who live really who live really close to that fuel. Um, so it's definitely something that you know we all need to be thinking about. But I think in the range of things we need to be thinking about, there are certainly things that are more urgent than that. That's how I think about it. Uh, all right. So I'm going to talk about our activity for the evening. Um, and Meg and I are going to be around, so feel free to come and ask us questions um, as we're working through the climate action prioritization. So that's our activity, prioritizing climate actions, as Meg said. Um, so we developed a list of climate actions or sort of preliminary climate actions for Topsum um, based on the assessments and reports that we've been working on. The Energy Committee helped develop this. Mark and Sky also helped 
um, developed this. So a lot of people came together to put together this list of climate actions that we are presenting to you tonight. So what we want from you is help refining this list and really narrowing it down because what we wanna include in the final climate action plan is a short list of priority actions that the town can focus on for the future. So we have kind of the laundry list here and we want you to tell us what's most important to you, what you think the town should focus on. So how are we gonna do that? So we have organized the climate actions into four categories. So these are the four categories. And there are four stations around the room and I'll, we'll, we'll move some of the chairs so there's a little more space, but there's two boards back there. Those are the red ones. Um, that's health, safety and town leadership. And then green over there is environment and waste management. These blue ones up here are resilient buildings and infrastructure. And then this orange one behind me is energy efficiency and sustainable transportation. So we have also organized the, um, the climate actions into sort of a hierarchy. So you have these categories and then we've organized them into general climate strategies. Um, and then within each strategy, there are these specific climate actions. And so it's really these climate actions that we want your input on, but I, everyone has a paper or everyone should have a paper. It doesn't look like this. It looks like my brothers. <laughs> it looks like this. Um, and so this paper lists all of the climate strategies. And so you can use this as you're working um, on this this evening to just kind of navigate around the room um, and understand kind of you know what the different strategies are, what the different um, categories are. So our suggestion for kind of how to work through um, all of this information. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to let you loose around the room. This is going to be sort of an unstructured time where you can talk to each other. You can um, spend some time at each of the boards, understand the climate actions. You can ask us questions if you don't fully understand them or you just want a little bit more information about them. You can leave us notes about them. Um, and you can start by reviewing that list of strategies that you're holding right now. Think about what which of those four categories you're most interested in um, or you think should be a really high priority. And then think about those strategies within each of those categories, you know, which of those are really important to you um, or, you know, really high priorities. So then you can use that to kind of um, focus your, your time on the boards or strategies that are most interesting to you. Um, and then when you're at these boards, we want you to take your sticky dots. Where are your sticky dots? Sure again. Thank you. So everyone has a sheet of sticky dots. Everyone has the same number of sticky dots. And you're going to use these to vote on which actions are most important to you or highest priority, highest priority to you. So you can use your sheet however you want. You can distribute it around the room, or you can, you know, put all of your dots on one action that you think is really important. <laughs> so feel free to use them however you want. Thank you. That's the last thing I'll ask for you. <laughs> um, so one thing is you do not need to review all of the climate actions. If you want to just focus on one of these areas for the whole time, that's totally fine. Um, if you want to take a look at, you know, all of them, you know, that's also totally fine. But don't feel like you need to read everything on each of these boards if that feels overwhelming to you. Something else um, just to be aware of is that the exact language of, the, of each of these actions might change um, for the for what we're going to put in the final climate action plan. So if you see something here and then you look at the final list and you're like, this doesn't look exactly the same. That's why we're just going to maybe make some some edits here and there um, as we're refining it. Um, and then the final thing is we're going to wrap up around 745 and that's when we'll have the Hanford gift card raffle. So stick around for that. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions before I let you off. Yeah. Um, can you just review again, once you have this climate action plan in place, do you go to the town meeting or is that it? I mean, is there another yeah. vetting process or that's what the town will then implement? Um, no. Next we'll have a, we'll, we'll take all this, put it into a report, we'll come back out back for a, a final workshop. Uh, then it needs to go to the select board okay. um, for approval. 
and they will recommend that it goes on the warrant and then it will go there will be a a uh, a period of public comment too uh, that can happen and then it will go for town meeting have you set the date for that third uh, public meeting we have not okay so we will we'll look for that in, in town town notices when we assemble all that you give us today and come back and we tell the recommendations mm -hmm. please <laughs> yeah now should we while we're doing this should we or what what would you advise or thinking about uh option versus uh effects of climate, uh, climate change and thinking local or global um I think, and let me know if this isn't really answering your question. I think it's sort of up to you, but I guess, and you know, if either of you have, you know want to weigh in on this, I think that thinking locally about you know sort of what's most important to Topsom is probably going to be most relevant to the town, because um, really the purpose of this plan is going to be you know putting out a putting out a plan for, you know, what can the town do? What does the town have, you know, some ability to take an action on? So I guess in that way, you know, thinking locally is kind of where we're focusing tonight. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, if not, come find me and we can have Okay. I don't know, do you guys have? I agree. Okay, yeah. cool. I would agree with you. I think we, we only have so much scope as a town that we can do, so. You know, keeping that in mind as you look at these actions, what a municipality of under 10,000 can do, that's really helpful because it'll make us more successful. Great. Yeah. Yeah, to follow on that, you partially answered my question, but um, will this document include actionable, measurable steps that the town could take? Yes. <laughs> That's a good answer. That's a great answer. That was, I like that. Yeah. So in the uh, greenhouse gas presentation, there were two yeah. categories. One was municipal, and it was like 785. Yeah. And then there was another category. I don't, I don't remember the name of it, but it was like 105,000. Yeah. So it would seem that how do we know which of these is associated? Because municipal yeah. is 0.17 or 0.75 percent. Mm -hmm of the 105. So I would be more interested in addressing what hits the 105. Do I know which of these are in that category? We didn't sort of designate them specifically, but we did call out specific actions that are related to the municipal operations versus sort of community-wide, um, you know, something that would kind of impact the whole community. Um, but they're not specifically sort of noted but um you will see that some of the actions you know talk about for example this one is ensure lighting in municipal buildings has been converted to led so that would be something that's related to you know municipal operations whereas um something like implementing a complete streets policy that's something that would be affecting more community-wide emissions does that make sense yep. and if you have questions about that ask either meg or i um, and we can we can help you figure that out all right i'm gonna <laughs> release you you can stand up <laughs> <or> walk around and also almost what I I'm going to
We want to vote for the whole thing. We just put it on the side of voting on individual action steps. Here's top to join you another town. Another town, another town. Are you guys looking at what could be done more than within each community by itself, or collectively with the four communities do something that may not be number one for town A, but all together has greater impact? That, that's a really good point, and I can address that. I think I will at the end of things. And, you know, I think what towns usually do is set their priorities, and then we see who has similar priorities. But right now, you know, we um, work with a Bath, Brunswick, Boatham, and Topsail okay. cohort together. So, because Bath just did their climate action plan. So, you know, we can definitely see where things overlap and then do something. Okay. Take that further. I mean, multiple counties. So that, <laughs> right. No, truly, because it is a, yeah. a, a global problem, yes. not just a top problem. Exactly right. And the second, will you be putting numbers? But I'm hearing a lot of people. How tall is tall? How short is short? How heavy is heavy? Supposed to be a number. So people have a sense of how this is progressing yeah. over many, many years. <laughs> 10 is better than 9, or 7 is better than whatever. I mean, for measuring your progress? Yeah. You know, a lot of these are is it done or is it not done? A lot of the actions are have they been done? Or are they not done? And so, as you're prioritizing, you can say, the next five years, we're going to focus on these yeah. five. Yeah. You know, are they done or are they not done? Well, except those five, each have a, a cost to them. Yeah. So, any way that can relate those dollars of cost to the benefit that comes from those, I think it helps sell the program. That's what I'm getting at. Yeah, well, that's a good thought. You know, I think as um, nice as they nice. decide on on what the priorities are, oh, yeah, in order yes. to like, you know, everyone wants to market, but in order to get community buy in and things like that, yeah, you know, a lot of people are going, yeah, they're going to want to know like what's you know, what's the return on investment, and at that time, you know, potentially that. Okay, so you're thinking that we could. But those are really good points. So, nice. <laughs> You got to do them. I'm just, just throwing ideas next time. <laughs> thank you for what you're doing. Oh, I'm <laughs> 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 
You can walk on water. Anyway, we just don't have any credits, so they got sold to somebody else. So they're getting credit for that. But still, apparently. I know. Well, it's actually a saving fund. We didn't buy the bag. We actually had to buy very much better than the So that's the way to go with the so the big part of our I know. Actually, yeah, Usually I'm on the outside of the I'm really in earnest starting my, my career outside of race, the race, and starting tomorrow. Thank <laughs> you. 
I realize I just want to put stickers on it all. I know. You don't have to worry about that. Going through all this part. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about my Oh, 
I can see the I mean, I, I heard something like this. 
share your screen first and then we can make a Are they Okay, coming back together, y'all. I'll ask them to project. So interestingly, I would say just looking around, just kind of an informal count here, uh, energy efficiency and thank you. Uh, sustainable transportation had a lot of dots and within that, uh, improving the resilience of the electric grid, uh, encouraging new development to consider underground power lines. Um, and incorporating resilience language and future climatic uh, conditions into town ordinances, uh, as well as land use planning and municipal policies. That's one from here. Um, the uh, continue to support and enhance uh, regional trail system. And there was one on, uh, yeah, the regional trail system. Yeah, lots of thoughts on there. Uh, the other thing that uh, uh, on this one, uh, environment and waste management. I think the one that maybe what I'll count to, because they're all they're kind of close, which is interesting, um, is to continue working with the uh, Brunswick Parks and Land Trust and to mean to expand existing conservation areas and flood prone uh, flood prone areas. So. Uh, on that. Uh, and then our year, this is a uh, health, safety, and town leadership that looked like you know, maybe this one or this one. This is uh, implement climate impact fees uh, on new development uh, to encourage resilience and sustainable development uh, and collaborate with local schools to incorporate climate change, resilience, and sustainability into their curriculum and building up. So that's that looks like kind of the highlights, but we'll go back and we'll do a little more uh, accurate count, um, you know, to be able to rank and prioritize things. But that's interesting. So thank you. Um, so upcoming events, as we mentioned, the next step is to finalize and adopt a climate action plan. Workshop three will be over the winter. Um, it probably looks like late January, early February, kind of our time frame. Uh, there would be public comments on the uh, proposal that we put out, select board approval in spring, and then town meeting in May. And I would like everybody to consider uh, coming to the Energy Committee meetings. They're open to the public. They're good, it's a good group. They're the fourth Tuesday of the month, and they're also available on Zoom. And they have an opening. <laughs> Who's on the energy committee? You've got pretty much the whole thing. <laughs> oh, I'm just saying that our, our energy committee meetings are from 4.30 to 536 um, up, upstairs in the building. We'd, we'd love to have somebody join us for, for, uh, to use new energy to keep continuing projects that will help, help make the town more resilient. <laughs> um, so thank you all for participating, and now we're going to draw a raffle for three conference gift cards. Okay, so the first one is ticket number 066280. That's me. Oh, wow. <laughs> 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 number two, 662-85. Six six two eight five. Oh, yeah, right. winner. I did right. Okay, lucky third one. Six six two eight eight. All right, thank you, everybody. And there's more food. Please help yourself. Please eat it. Right. 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 Right.